There's something rather magical about radio waves. They're actually a sort of invisible energy. This aerial can actually pick up enough of this energy to power this primitive receiver I made. It has no battery. It relies entirely on harnessing the energy of the radio waves in the air. It's not very loud, so um, I'll have to put it straight on the microphone so you can hear it. I managed to pick up Radio Israel broadcasting from Jerusalem on it one night. Although there's something quite wonderful about this little thing, radio sets have been around for so long now that uh, they've become rather ordinary, unglamorous contraptions. And even the electronics inside now look rather familiar. In this programme, I'm going to look at how these mysterious radio waves were discovered and how radio receivers managed to pick them up. Creating radio waves is actually very simple. Any electric spark emits them. Each of these sparks is sending out radio waves. You hear them on the radio as interference. That's why lightning makes radios crackle. And even the tiny spark inside a light switch is enough to produce a little pop. But without a radio set, though, it's not easy to detect these waves, and most scientists didn't believe they existed till just over a hundred years ago. What finally convinced them was an experiment performed by the physicist Heinrich Hertz in 1887. It was first demonstrated in Britain by a scientist called Oliver Lodge, here in the Royal Institution. Hertz used very big sparks created by a, a machine like this called an induction coil. Could you turn it on, Bill? This was connected to these metal plates with another spark gap in the middle and uh, this acted as a sort of aerial. This was Hertz's receiver. It's simply a loop of copper wire. Well, the big spark uh, creates radio waves with enough energy to make a tiny spark jump across the gap between these balls in the receiver when they're held very close together. So, um, hold these in position. OK, Bill. If you look carefully, you can just see the spark jumping across the gap. These sparks are so tiny that Hertz had to let his eyes get accustomed to the dark for 15 minutes and then watch the sparks through a magnifying glass. His apparatus only had a range of a few metres and he had no interest in finding any practical uses for it. The first person to use radio waves for signalling was Giuliano Marconi. Marconi had been a difficult child. His mother was a Jameson from the Irish whisky distillers who'd run away to Italy to be an opera singer and married an Italian landowner. She quickly got bored on his estate. There's not much going on here. I think we'll go for a little jaunt. The infant Marconi spent much of his childhood being dragged round Europe by his mother. Where are we going, Mama? Uh, Barcelona, or perhaps Boulogne. Yatti colorati, la 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 la. Color, color, la 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 la. He showed little interest at school and constantly irritated his father with ridiculous scientific experiments. Shortly after failing to get into university, he happened to read an article about Hertz's work. He immediately started obsessively experimenting and had soon managed to transmit the signals over a mile. Still aged only 20, he arrived in England to try and sell his ideas. This is Marconi's original equipment that he brought to England with him. This is his transmitter with an induction coil like Hertz's and these balls that concentrated the energy of the spark. One end would have been connected to the aerial. This is his receiver. The aerial went on here. This is his coherer inside the glass tube. The filings are actually in the gap in the middle. 
and this is the device to tap it. Marconi would have been sending a, a combination of long pulses and short pulses, uh, sending messages in Morse code. Well, this original apparatus only had a range of about three miles, but Marconi gradually increased the sensitivity of his coherers and the size of his transmitters till he was sending messages hundreds of miles. The larger transmitters had much larger spark gaps, which got very noisy, so he had to take to putting them in enclosed boxes. Marconi's early systems had a big disadvantage. They couldn't be tuned. You can hear the signal from our spark transmitter all across the short, medium and long wave bands. The reason is that sparks create chaotic waves of all sorts of different wavelengths. What was needed was a more precise transmitter than a spark. This was the solution, the tuned circuit. It suddenly all starts to look like a proper radio, but the basic parts are still quite simple. There's a coil of wire here called an inductor and a series of overlapping metal plates here called a capacitor. The electricity whizzes backwards and forwards from one to the other, oscillating thousands of times a second. The valve acts as a sort of pump, keeping the whole thing going. You can see a picture of the radio waves this tune circuit's transmitting on this oscilloscope that I've hooked up to a short aerial. If I hold it near the tuned circuit and switch on, you can see how regular the oscillations or waves that uh, it's transmitting are. Now, if I compare this uh, with the spark machine, you can see just how chaotic its radio waves are. Once the tune transmitter had been perfected, spark transmitters were quickly banned for polluting the airwaves. With the problem of interference solved, radio seemed so miraculous that it could be capable of almost anything. Early radios did still have one limitation, they couldn't transmit speech, only the simple pulses of Morse code. Morse code still used for messages on the shortwave band, and pulse codes are also used in, for radio controlled models. I built this little car for a children's television series and I've hooked up the oscilloscope to the transmitter so you can actually see the stream of pulses that the car receives. Uh, if I work this switch, that's the one that works the headlights, you can see it just moves one pulse. If I shift that one, it works two pulses which actually opens the door. This one works the steering from left to right, you see it's moving four pulses. This one is shifting five pulses, and that's the speed control for forwards and backwards control, um, and so forth. Each, each series of pulses work a different function inside the car. <laughs> 